This episode of Access to the Arts is being made possible through the support of First Bank Richmond, with eight locations serving Wayne County. First Bank Richmond and you, doing great things together. Welcome to Access to the Arts on WETV Channel 20. The keen viewer will note that I am not your regular host, Eric Marsh. In fact, Eric is out of town, likely getting some kind of award for his esteemed career, so he asked me to sit in for him. I'm David Paxton, and I'm very glad to start this, my first segment, with uh, Whitney Reeves, Executive Director of Richmond Civic Theater, the theater having such a solid place in my heart. <laughs> met my wife there. So, Whitney, thanks for joining mm, us. Thank you for having me. It's... You have a very, very exciting schedule lined up for the whole season, but really coming up in the next couple months. We do. This is sort of our busy time, so we're getting some auditions in. We have some shows coming up, so excuse me while I consult my calendar That's because right. I can't memorize all these dates. So, uh, <laughs> the first audition coming up is November 3rd and 4th. We'll be auditioning for Stinky Kids, which is a stage one production, but it's a little unique okay. because it's put on by adults. So we flip the roles, and all of the technical roles will be children. Really? So, yes, even our director is only a sophomore in high school, and then all of the actors are adults. I have to think that the challenge is going to be exciting, and whatever comes out of it is going to be fun no matter what. Absolutely. It's a super fun show. It's hilarious, and of course, it's all these ridiculous characters played by adults, which makes it even funnier, and it's for kids, but the auditions are for adults. So. And uh, those who want to audition, where can they go to uh, get the information on what they might want to audition for? Our Facebook page is absolutely the best. You can do the Stage 1 Youth Theater Facebook page or the Richmond Civic Theater Facebook page, and you'll find our events listed there. Um, and then after that, the week after that, actually, on November 15th, 16th, and 17th, you get to see our Stage 1 kids on stage for Emma, the pop musical. It is a super fun take on Jane Austen's Emma. I was going to ask that. Yes. yes. I've been kind of relating it to the movie Clueless, um, except with fun pop music from everything from the Supremes to Katy Perry. They sing it all. So It wasn't Clueless based on Emma it in was. some ways. So it it's was. just kind of a nice turn to come back to that. Absolutely. It's going to be a great show. Um, that's directed by our Stage 1 Managing Director, Ryan Shaw. So he always pulls together really, really solid performances, and it's going to be wonderful. And then back to the audition thing. You have auditions coming up for... We do. Another one for Ordinary People. That, those auditions will be on November 17th and 19th at the theater. Um, that's directed by Dave Cobine. Um, Ordinary People, some people might remember the movie from, I think it came out in the 70s. Does that uh, sound about right? About 1980, I think. Oh, yeah, 80, you're, okay. you're, you're pretty close. Pretty close. Um, and that is, it's going to be a, a heavy show. It's a serious show, but it's going to be really challenging for our actors and for our audience and in the best possible way, right? So um, we like to get the drama in theater, and that is going to do it. So those auditions will be also really great to come out for if you've ever thought about auditioning. It's a smaller cast, so you really really get to work with your character and really develop that. So it's going to be a great time. That will be good. And yeah. then finally, it wouldn't be heading into the holiday season without something heading in, uh, in December, correct? Yes. yes. So our Christmas Carol rehearsals are already well underway. Um, and that those performances will be December 13th through 15th. And then again, on the 20th through the 22nd. So right before Christmas, you can bring your family to see Christmas Carol the musical. So it's a fun take on the classic tale. Excellent. Sounds yeah. like a lot of good shows getting ready to uh, show up on the stage at Richmond City Theater. Absolutely. We got a full fall season. So. All right. Whitney Reeves, thank you for thank joining you. us today. Whitney Reeves, Executive Director of Richmond Civic Theater. Tell us first of all, um, 
a little bit about you, where you're from, and how you got started with, with pottery. Okay. So I'm originally from Lafayette, Indiana, and I just recently graduated from Earlham College. I majored in art with a focus in ceramics, and I decided that I was going to spend the year working on pottery here in Richmond. So I just rented a space downtown, and I'm getting things set up right now. And um, yeah, it's great to be um, working full time on art. Um, I th what, ins what inspires you? What inspires me? I am really inspired by local materials, actually. Um, a couple of platters over here, I spent uh, about a month or so during my senior year really trying to key in on processing materials that I was researching and finding from around Indiana. I really feel like um, these materials add a lot to my pieces in that I get to decide how to process them, which allows me to kind of give myself a canvas to work with and um, a color palette. So right now I found that local materials are driving, driving what I'm making. How has being here in Richmond um, worked out for you so far? Are people being able to find you and what's the response to your work? I think the response has been positive. I've had some chances to get down to the farmers market and talk with people and it's exciting to hear that, um, that the community is so supportive of artists working downtown. I don't think there are too many right now but it sounds great. Um, I've got a couple studio mates and we've just set up on 8th and Main Street down in the Whitney Center and we're getting, uh, getting things rolling, it feels like. What makes you create what you create? It mostly seems to be useful as opposed to artistic. Yeah. Why is that? So I feel like pottery should be functional first and form foremost. Um, a lot of the people that I'm inspired by make functional pots. Um, but I really have been enjoying exploring things like these tiles down here. Um, I feel like you can showcase some local materials a little bit better when you don't have to worry about utility. Um, local materials are a little, little finicky, um, so I've been developing clay with these materials and sometimes we'll have things like rocks poke out. It'll create a hole in a pot and uh, can't really work that way. So what I try and focus primarily on with my um, functional pots is utility, thinking about what forms are nice to hold in the hand, what's nice to have your morning cup of coffee out of. Um, yeah, so. When you say local materials, what are some of the interesting things that you've been able to find and without giving anything away, where are you finding it? Oh, certainly, yeah. So actually, I um, spent a couple months working as the property manager for Earlham's biology department and had a chance to travel around to a couple different sites around town and one of them is south of town, just down 27. There's this lovely um, kind of stream cut and up the side of the bank is this great um, blue clay that I found just amongst the rocks. And I've been able to use that and turn it into a glaze, which unfortunately I don't have anything here, but that's kind of what I've primarily been doing with these local materials is finding ways to incorporate them onto the clay that I buy commercially. Thomas, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Holidays are always a busy time, plenty to see and do, and Joe Lapone from Earlham College is going to tell us a little bit about some of what you can get involved in on the Earlham College campus. Yeah, so on uh, December 6th and December 7th, we always invite the community to attend our uh, high impact dance alloy performances um, presented by all of our Earlham students. Um, it's a high energy, very family friendly show um, located in Wilkinson Theater and Runyon Student Center. And then our last event for the holidays is our Christmas candlelight service on Monday, December 9th. Uh, so come around, sing some carols, um, have some snacks, and celebrate the uh, Christmas season. I have had the pleasure of taking care of probably 35,000 cataract patients. It really is meaningful to people. It changes their lives, it gives them back things that that they hold dear, it seems like you can't do anything without proper banking help. I've had a very good experience working with First Bank.
you have people that you know and you grow a relationship with. I just have the confidence that the banking part of it will be okay. Welcome back to Access to the Arts. I know, I really wasn't supposed to be part of this show, but that happens sometimes. We are spending a little time in the WCTV studio with Jessica Raposo, who is Assistant Professor of Music here at Indiana University East. Thanks for taking some time with us. Oh, my pleasure. A um, Couple of things I wanna talk about. You're an Assistant Professor of Music. There'll be a lot of people that go, I really didn't know there was music instruction going on at <laughs> IU East. Talk a little bit about what that looks like here. Well, believe it or not, our first music classes were taught here in the 1980s. And, and then the program that we have now is about 10 years old now. Our students are able to come here and study music formally as a part of the Bachelor of Arts and Humanities degree. There's a music track that exists within that. And they get a great foundation of music theory, music history, and then also what I categorize as music creation. They take lessons on instruments. They take uh, lessons in composition, if that's what they're interested in, or computer music. Okay. And uh, then they get to do a great senior project to feature what it is they love about music, and it goes from there. The performance so. aspect of this has continued to rise here on campus. I've noticed over the last couple of years, there have been student performances, both on and off campuses, part of the spirit of philanthropy luncheon. Um, there have been student performances at least each of the last three years, I think, that I can think of, singers, piano players, um, other the French horn player I think we had this year. Mm -hmm. um, and you're also taking that out in the community a little bit more. Talk about what that looks like. So for the students who take private lessons uh, for, for credit here on campus, we actually have for years had an end of semester recital where students had the option to perform. And usually that wasn't heavily advertised. It was just for the students and their families and friends to come and enjoy them and sort of celebrate the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. And then when I came, I really wanted to start inviting the campus community and, and the regional community to come and enjoy these performances. So we started publicizing them more. We also started having our, what we call our capstone students, the students that are completing the degree. It's the final course that they take. Okay. Um, in addition to doing their final senior recital or senior presentation, here on campus, they do a bit of a, what we bill as the dress rehearsal, but a chance for them to get out in the community and do a presentation somewhere else. So they've been at Roscoe's, they've been at Golden Living, they've been at Friends Fellowship, they've been at the Leland. And that way they, they get to try out their recital once before the final, which is a part of their grade, but then also they get the joy of sharing it beyond Vivian Auditorium in IU East. Student so, recital this year is coming up in December? It is. It's Tuesday, December 9th, I believe is the date, the Tuesday of that week. Um, and this year, because uh, Vivian Auditorium is undergoing some renovation, we're actually going to be at the community room at Friends Fel Fellowship. So, um, you know, everybody is welcome to come and, and hear them there. It's at 7 p.m. that evening. Again, the uh, people who enjoy sports will be able to see a pep band because there's a pep band director. Our pep band is back. Uh, this is the second year of its reincarnation, so we're excited about that. And basketball season is starting, so we're going to have them at some of the games as well. Okay. Uh, Dr. Nathan Froby is our new pep band director, and he's been doing a great job with them. So looking forward to that. Now, if the students are performing, the instructors have to do some performing. and. <laughs> I'm going to get my hand slapped. I stole this off the uh, <laughs> Jessica Raposo Performs. You're yes. doing flute, alto flute, and piccolo all at the same time. It, yes, it's true. <laughs> I, I may have been off more than I can chew, but we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I mean, I've been performing on our faculty recitals the last few years, but I haven't done a full recital here since 2014, and so I finally said it's about time. And uh, so I will be playing a program of All-American Works, which I'm really excited about. I've got five different pieces. Um, three of them have been composed in the last 15 years. Two of them are by female composers, which you don't always hear. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've got two wonderful guest artists joining me. Diane Frazier is an amazing pianist who performs all over the world as a collaborative pianist. And Dr. Mihoko Watanabe, who is the professor of flute at Ball State and a friend of mine going back to college days, um, yes. is coming to perform on two of the pieces with me. So it's going to be a wonderful program in Whitewater Lobby next week. There's also another faculty recital coming up, I think you mentioned, in November? Um, the other one in November is our choir. Okay, that's the, the choir. That's our choir, and they're going to be doing a wonderful program on Wednesday, November 20th. 
that evening. Also in Whitewater Lobby, it's themed welcome. It's all music designed to discuss diversity and acceptance and, and, and celebrate um, the world that we have. And a lot of new music by American young American composers that they'll be performing. It's going to be fabulous. The faculty concert is coming up, though. Okay. And that will be in February. We're trying to make this an annual event at the end of February to do a faculty recital. I actually like to call it Faculty and Friends because we very often have Earlham music professors on the program as well. Nice. And we like to enjoy that collaboration with them. Keep your eye out for that. We'll update you as these dates get a little bit closer. Find out more about what's happening at the music department at uh, Indiana University East and find out where some of the students are performing in and around town so you can go and enjoy and actually support their work. Jessica Raposa, thanks for spending some time. Thank you so much, Eric. As we head into the holiday season, there is a lot going on around the community, and one of the places you can see a really great show, Civic Hall Performing Arts Center. As a guy who grew up in the Chicago area, I hear I'm really going to enjoy this group coming in. It's a, it's a, the title of the group's Brass Transit, and they're a Chicago tribute band. They sound exactly like the group Chicago from the 70s and 80s. Uh, they have the horns in the background. Uh, the, the lead vocals sound just like Peter Satira. I mean, it's... It's amazing, and they'll be doing their Christmas show. All of the all the holiday tunes that everybody knows, but they're off the Chicago album, the, yes. or the two albums that they put out. So they'll sound just like you're having a live concert with Chicago, only it's brass transit, and that's uh, December seventh at three thirty. We're real excited to have them in. Sounds good. We're yeah. looking forward to that and the rest of your proudly presenting series. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Back to this episode of Access to the Arts. We're talking with Monica Kochlein from the Richmond Symphony Orchestra. Mm -hmm. Hello there. Hi, Eric. How are you? I'm great. great. This is a this is a big time for a lot of the not-for-profits mm -hmm. in the community. Um, this is Wayne County Challenge Match time, mm -hmm. and a lot of the arts organizations try to get involved in that. We've got the the list: mm -hmm. Richmond Art Museum, Civic Theater, Community Orchestra, Shakespeare Festival, and of course the Symphony Orchestra. Mm -hmm. One of the big things about about the challenge match is that it brings in um, operational dollars which yeah. are hard to come by really hard to come by. I mean, it's really easy to find grant opportunities to apply for projects and programs and to keep those sustained. But just to find the money to operate and to carry out those programs is really difficult. So I applaud the Wayne County Foundation for recognizing the need for operating support six or seven years ago when they started the challenge match. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, just one of the few organizations that are willing to really put the dollars on the line that way. If someone is interested, there's a time frame. I know you've probably got your letters out. You've got your donors <laughs> lined up. There Absolutely. are some rules and hoops that not-for-profits need Absolutely. to jump through. Why don't you run us through a couple of those so people sure. who might want to be involved can be? Sure. So dollars have to be um, collected November 4th to 12th. There's a little bit of a, you know, if the if the check is dated the 12th but arrives on the 14th, that's still okay. So you've got some of that magic going on. Um, and, um, you know, dollars um, can be counted up to a thousand dollars so if someone pays you more than that you can only count the first thousand kind of new this year though and a lot of our organizations I think are trying to figure and navigate that but I believe that most will be successful is that now um, if you're at the ten thousand dollar level like the symphony is you have to match ten thousand dollars before you can start working on the ten thousand dollars and so you really have to raise twenty thousand dollars to get that 10 from the Wayne County Foundation. So wow. it's a little tricky. It's a little tricky as to how to know what to count and when to count. But um, but this community really loves its nonprofits, in particular its arts organizations, and they always step up during this time. Okay. So that date, remember those dates again so that you can be involved in that, and that's November, November 4th. November 4th through the 12th, the Monday through the following Tuesday. Okay. Um, the, we just had 
recently the 63rd annual, mm -hmm. interesting, mm -hmm. Young Artist Competition. Um, I, I've, I've recorded a number of these mm -hmm. over the last seven, eight yeah. years. Um, last year we talked about there it was the first vocalist that I could mm -hmm. remember. This year right. there were two vocalists. Talk about what you saw from the young people performing. Well, I was really excited by the pool that we had. We had some local students, three local students, and we had three from a bit of a distance. Um, all, all six, though, were females, which I really loved. So um, we had a violist, we had a marimbist, uh, we had two vocalists, as you mentioned. Um, we had a French horn player, yes. and we had a pianist. Mm -hmm. So we had a really great variety everywhere from the seventh grade up to twelfth grade. So it was a really nice span, a really nice opportunity for us to celebrate the work of the work that these young musicians put into their talent. The uh, winner was actually a homeschool student? She is a homeschool student from Loveland, Ohio. So a year ago, we changed the rules just a bit to kind of capture some more students. We um, opened it up that if, uh, if we have a principal musician in the orchestra and they have a private student, that student can compete in our competition. Um, last year, that wasn't the case. We had a couple, but they were not the winners. But this year, our principal violist, Belinda Burke, student one, Teresa Orth. So we're really excited to have her this year. actually into your next concert which is coming up on the 24th November, of November 24th we're doing movie magic and the winner of the young artist competition always plays solo with the orchestra so we're really excited to see the conclusion of our education programming and, and really end the year in a big way okay <laughs> Monica Coachline with the Richmond Symphony Orchestra part of the Wayne County Challenge don't forget the concert on the 24th mm -hmm. with the young artist winner mm -hmm. um, is there anything that I'm missing really quickly <laughs> I think that's enough for now we'll All talk right. again in the spring we'll talk again in the spring Monica thanks for being here thank you Welcome back to the program, and we are spending a beautiful fall afternoon here in the quad at uh, the campus of Indiana University East, which is kind of appropriate because we asked Carrie Longley to make the long commute from your office and classroom oh, yes. to come join us to talk about what's coming up for you. What, what are you in the midst of planning? Well, uh, right now we have uh, 58 art pieces that are being installed in Whitewater Hall in the Tom Thomas Gallery and the Meyer Artway. And um, jurors, a couple weeks ago, three jurors um, selected those pieces. They re reviewed over 200 images and narrowed it down to 58 art pieces. And these were submitted online from artists um, that live in states adjacent to Indiana. Mm -hmm. So it's the Whitewater Valley Art Competition. And as you mentioned, it's artists from all over the area, really a broad area, mm -hmm. that have submitted their pieces for work. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, what the judging might entail as they look at some of those pieces. Well, um, first, the judges are looking to make sure that there's quality images of these pieces. Some pieces were excluded during the judging just because they couldn't tell uh, clarity in the image or they couldn't see all sides of a sculptural piece. Um, so they're looking to make sure that the piece, they can clearly review the piece. Um, they're looking at the technical execution or craftsmanship of the art pieces, uh, originality of expression. They also, towards the end of the judging, they ensure that um, all of the pieces look good as a whole because it is a group exhibition. The pieces will be displayed side by side. Uh, they're also making sure that the, um, the artists have 
followed the rules of competition so that the pieces can fit through the gallery doors. <laughs> we do have size That's restrictions. That's always important. It yes, is, it there is you important. Go. It's not an outdoor exhibition. So, <laughs> yeah, um, so they're looking mostly at originality of expression and technical execution and craftsmanship. All right, and you're getting it set up, so it is about to open here mm -hmm. coming up very soon. Yes, yes, and on Friday evening at the opening reception, we will be announcing the award winners. So uh, we have over $5,000 in award money, so um, I, that's what draws a lot of artists uh, to the competition, is knowing that there's a chance to, to be rewarded for all of their efforts. And that's uh, Friday evening the 18th? Yes. And uh, then the uh, competition, the show, basically will run till when? It runs through the end of December. Okay. So the Whitewater Valley Art Competition will be in Whitewater, uh, the, the hall right here on the campus of Indiana University East. Uh, Carrie Longley, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, that wraps up this Access to the Arts for the month. I'm Dave Paxton. Once again, thanks for joining us. And also thanks to the guests who came out today to enjoy a beautiful afternoon here at the campus of Indiana University East. As we leave you, here are some things that are going to be going on in the near future to help you get your access to the arts. This episode of Access to the Arts is being made possible through the support of First Bank Richmond, with eight locations serving Wayne County. First Bank Richmond and you, doing great things together.